Join us now for Education Matters, a weekly look at the real people and real stories in education across North Carolina. Welcome to another episode of Education Matters presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Keith Poston. K-12 education is being transformed nationally and here in North Carolina as schools take advantage of new technologies to enhance learning. This week's show, we're going to talk about the state of digital learning in North Carolina with those helping lead it and those implementing it in the classroom. Like every week before we tackle our main topic, we open with a segment we call Edlines. It's a quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. The discovery that 40% of all graduates of Kestrel Heights Charter School in Durham failed to meet minimum state requirements for graduation continues to rock the school. Last week, the state's charter school advisory board recommended that the K-12 charter school shutter its high school completely July 1st. Advisory board chair Alex quickly cited the growth in the number of charters and the increasing number of applicants as reasons that the board should explore better oversight in order to catch problems sooner. Kestrel Heights diploma problem wasn't discovered for eight years. Senate leader Phil Berger signaled more teacher pay raises could be on the way in remarks during the ceremonial opening day of the General Assembly on January 11th. State legislators returned to work in earnest on January 25th. Senator Berger said he's committed to raising average teacher pay to $55,000 in the next two years. It's projected to be just at $50,000 this school year. House Speaker Tim Moore did not make a similar dollar figure pledge, but did say legislators had come to believe increasing teacher pay is a good thing. As Donald Trump prepared to be sworn in as president this week, a group of 175 deans of schools of education from across the country, including several from North Carolina, sent a letter that urged President-elect Trump to uphold the role of public education. The deans urged him to invest in education as a public good, to advocate for vulnerable and marginalized children through laws, and support that seek to close opportunity gaps and protect civil rights and to develop and implement policies, laws, and reform initiatives based on actual educational research. Finally, another, week, or another report showing the importance of early childhood education. The recently released International PISA exam score showed stronger math results for students who have participated in at least a few years of education between ages three and five, before the start of formal primary school. In most countries, students who attended two to three years of preschool performed 50 scale points better in math as 15-year-olds than on the 2015 PISA than those who had attended less than a year. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click on Education Matters, and read more about each of the headlines as well as other topics we cover each week. As I said at the top of the show, we're going to talk today about digital learning. North Carolina's public schools are moving quickly to take advantage of both improved internet connectivity and new technology to enhance learning. Joining us today are two key leaders in the effort to, to change North Carolina's learning and, and move into a more digital learning platform. With us first, we have Dr. Maria Petrie-Martin. She is the Chief Academic and Digital Learning Officer at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And we have Dr. Jenny Korn. Jenny is the Director of Evaluation Programs for the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation. So thank you both for being on the show today. Let me start with a real basic question. I'll ask you uh, first, Maria, since it's in your title, you're the Chief Digital Learning Officer. What is digital learning? What, what do we mean when we say that? What we mean when we say digital learning is really about our students and our educators across the state using digital resources in teaching the North Carolina standard course of study. Uh, we know that many of our educators across the state are currently using technology for assessments, for example, to be able to provide real-time data on assessments that can be used to inform instruction very often on that same day or the very next day. Um, we also know that much of the multimedia digital resources that students and teachers are using certainly makes instruction more engaging. So that is what digital teaching and learning is all about. Okay. Well, let me ask you, um, Jenny, I know that uh, you and the Friday Institute, where you work, um, has been a key partner um, with the state of North Carolina on digital learning. So but where, how did North Carolina start down this path? I mean, we know about technology changes. I mean, we were all experiencing ourselves, but sort of when did it become sort of the education thing? So 
Going back to about 2000, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction published these impact guidelines. They were really the recommendations that the State Department were making for folks in the schools about how to implement in this new kind of age of digital learning. Um, it all started with the No Child Left Behind Act at the federal level. There was some um, legislation around enhancing education through technology. So North Carolina did a great job of leveraging those federal dollars to kind of get things started. Um, the lieutenant governor at the time, um, lieutenant governor's office, Governor Purdue, um, really did a lot of visionary thinking. <laughs> They established the e-learning commission to really make re recommendations to the, our joint education oversight commission and the state board of education about um, thinking about kind of long-term planning. Um, so they established and made recommendations around the school connectivity initiative, which was initially funded in 2007. And that was really that's about getting the getting internet services to the schools, right? I mean, and and, and, with, and the infrastructure within the, the the school building itself. Absolutely. So that's a question that, just like Maria was just talking about, with digital resources and activities in the classroom, you can't do that unless you have a really strong infrastructure, so that when the teachers and the students, I mean, we've got 1.5 million kids in the state of North Carolina. We've got 2,600 schools, 100,000 educators. When all of those, when you know, all of those people are trying to access resources digitally, you have to make sure that your, you know, that your infrastructure is strong and set. And so, I think the leadership at the state level really set that in motion. And right now, we're celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the School Connectivity Initiative. Um, the General Assembly also allocated funds in 2008 to set up a pilot study. It was a really unique opportunity for a public-private partnership between the Golden Leaf Foundation, the Department of Public Instruction, the Friday Institute. And they initially set it up in eight pilot high schools across the state. Um, and then it expanded to 18. And we learned a great deal about what worked, what didn't work, um, because of that because of that fun initial funding we got from, from the state. That's, that's great. Maria, so, so we've done a lot um, yes. since 2000. But where, so where are we now? I mean, sort of, I guess, where are uh, the gaps? I mean, clearly, we're not at the, I guess, future state or where we want to be. Certainly. So we know that currently a lot of our school districts and our charter schools are using a lot of technology tools. But we also know that we have something in the state called home base, where we have hundreds of thousands of our educators, the 1.5 million students across the state that are receiving access through a statewide uh, home base system to use digital tools and get assessment items that are aligned to the standard course of study. But what we know in the future is that we see technology as a way for our students to engage with people across the world. You know, having a classroom of students be able to engage in a lesson with a historian at the Natural History mu Museum right. is huge for our students. Mm -hmm. And I think the next component is really working with our educators on the digital learning competencies. We know that our State Board of Education approved those in June of 2016. We know that our new state superintendent is really involved in innovation and digital learning. So what we would like to see in the future is media literacy, more of an awareness for our students. We know that many of our students are not always sure what is unbiased information on the internet. And I think that is an important next step for all of us to make that as a priority, not only for our educators, but our parents as well. Well, those are all. That's that's a great point. So it sounds like to me, um, Jenny, we're moving from again making sure that it can actually work. You know that we actually have the, to, to the best uses of it. We're going to have a couple of educators on uh, next who are going to mm -hmm. talk about what they're doing in their school. But that, is that sort of what's next in terms of the digital uh, <laughs> transformation? Absolutely. I think w the goal, right, in the state of North Carolina, it's there's a every child has a constitutional right to a sound basic education. And in 2017, that means a personalized education kind of facilitated by educators that have access to this, to high quality digital resources aligned to the standards, data and assessment so that they can make and personalize learning for every child, meet that child where they are. The way that you do that, right, is with really high quality assessments, data at your fingertips. So. For me, and I think for many of the leaders in the state, um, 
digital tools, digital resources offers a way to modernize our education system in a way that, that has never happened before. It's a revolution, really, I think. Right. Uh, real quick, uh, last comment from you, Maria, on sort of what, uh, sort of what's your hope uh, as you move forward with, uh, with this. Definitely. I agree with Dr. Korn that we would love to see every single one of our students in the state of North Carolina using digital resources to enhance their learning. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, also using those digital resources to ensure that the world opens up for our students across the state of North Carolina. Virtual field trips, for example, are huge in connecting children to experiences that they would never have otherwise. So we are so excited about the possibility for digital teaching and learning in the state of North Carolina. Well, lots of exciting things mm -hmm. happening. Um, I'm glad you guys came on today and told us about it, gave us a little bit of a background that was really helpful, and mm -hmm. hope you'll come back and see us, and we'll talk some more about it. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Kate. But when we come back on the show, we're going to be joined by a principal and a teacher who are using technology in their school to change how we teach our children. But first, as we go to break, see if you can answer this question. True or false, there are more mobile Internet users than desktop Internet users. Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer true? Worldwide, 52% of internet users access it using a mobile device. In the US, that number is actually 75%. Um, our next two guests are from a middle school in Wake County that is successfully using technology to enhance the learning experience for its students. So we have, uh, we have the principal of uh, Pine Hollow Middle School, Andrew Livengood. We appreciate you being here. And Harden Barker, who is a math teacher also at Pine Hollow Middle. Thanks for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. So, um, so you just heard from uh, some of the folks at the state level about what their goals are. Um, and I know you and I talked, uh, Andrew, last week as we were planning the show. You're doing a lot of these things. Tell us about what's going on at Pine Hollow. We are. It's exciting. Um, we have a lot of technology in the classroom. I can walk down the hall every day. I stick my head in any classroom. Kids are uh, spread out, uh, working either individually or in small groups, whether it's on an iPad or a, a laptop, what have you. But at Pine Hollow, um, it's not an extra add-on. Uh, technology is something that we've come to depend on, and it's essential to the learning process at our school. Right now, you're, you're, you're a fairly new school, right? First, you've been in, around for a year, so it was Correct. obviously it was built with some connectivity. But really, all, all the schools, certainly around in, in most of the state, have um, sort of the wireless access now in all the classrooms. So you don't have right. any sort of uh, barriers in terms of that kind of technology. Support. No, we do not, and that's huge because if you don't have connectivity, it's very difficult. Um, to be tied down to a cord, something that's got to plug into a wall. So we are completely uh, wireless. All right, well, Hard, let me go to you. You're a math teacher. Um, um, my daughter loves math. I was challenged in math, but let me ask you, so is, um, is technology really uh, primarily used in, uh, in a school like Pine in, in math and science, or is it uh, uh, sort of uh, across the board? How, do you, how have you seen it as, as a math teacher yourself and then uh, with your, your colleagues? It's definitely a tool that can be used effectively, especially with how students interact with their world today. Everything that students do, especially with social media, since they are so integrated with, with computers in their personal lives, the more that we use that in the educational setting, the more they're going to be usually inclined to pay attention. It's, it's a much better way to facilitate and get their attention as compared to doing it the old way like when you and I were yeah. in school. I mean, they, I, mean, that, I mean, they live it. I have a 16-year-old and I mean, with the things we were talking about, 75% of, of people access the internet now using mobile devices. I mean, it wasn't just a few years ago when mobile devices, you couldn't, you really couldn't access the internet. And if you could, right. it was just, you know, small, you really, I mean, it's, it's a, it, they've never, they have not, like, they've never not known that, right? They haven't. <laughs> and so one of the things, I guess, as a teacher, you need to be, uh, meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. So, well, how does, um, as the principal, um, you know, you've got to make sure that your teachers are comfortable with this technology. How do y'all go about, um, you know, what do you do, what does the, the, the school district do, the state do to, to help teachers, you know, you know, some of them who are old like me, you know, uh, to, to use all these tools effectively? It's actually not hard uh, to get the teachers excited, because um, as uh, Harden just said a second ago, the kids live in this world, right, with their, with their thumbs. And, 
Um, so with the teachers, there's so many resources out there that are available to them. Um, especially your, your younger teachers that have recently come through a College of Education teacher program. Um, at Pine Hollow, we're three to one. Uh, that is the model um, for our school district. What does that mean? Um, it means um, one device for every three kids. Okay. So it forces them to collaborate and communicate with one another. The four C's are another big buzzword in education today, mm -hmm. so the technology fits really well into that. The challenge for me as a principal a lot of times is to educate my parents as to, not literally my parents, but my kids, <laughs> sure. um, Pine Hollow parents, as to uh, what education looks like today. Because as you said a second ago, it's changed over the years. And so I've got some teachers with flipped classrooms where instead of standing up in front of the students and lecturing, uh, the teacher uh, delivers uh, the direct instruction, the lecture via video that the kids watch at home, and then they come in the next day and the teacher can work with uh, students who experience difficulty in one particular area, um, and that's new for parents as well. Um, many of our parents are used to coming in and listening to a lecture and then going home and doing the, the homework, so trying to um, educate the parents as to how things have changed is certainly a principal's challenge today. Right. Well, Harden, as, as a teacher, I mean, you've obviously, you're using it. I mean, I'd love to hear an example for how, how do you use it, technology? Say that something that's different than than you know maybe what you would have done uh, several years ago before these things were available. Something that's really cool is the use of manipulatives in a classroom, especially in math. The more concrete you make it, the better that the kids are going to learn it. Especially students who math isn't their forte, like myself when I was growing up. Um, you have kits, physical objects that we have at Pine Hollow that we that the kids can use. Um, they also have virtual manipulatives that you can connect a tablet, iPad, for example, to our classroom so television. You're, you're literally talking about something to hold in your hand to move. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about something virtual. This like, is well, yeah, we like we have fraction tiles that let's say you okay. have from one sixteenth through one half. You can have the kids that are using that, and then that matches it on the television. The okay, so gotcha. you can do that with on a TV and a bigger screen so that they can follow along with you. They can also drag and drop with their fingers using that tool themselves. Sometimes just using it in a concrete way physically doesn't work, but if they can drag along the uh, tablet or device, then that makes it click for them. So the more ways that we can find to get the kids for them to understand it, the better off we are. So it's, it's true. I mean, it's a tool. I mean, it's not like something that you can just turn on. Well, we've got computers now. We've got three to one. We're done. I mean, it's really. I mean, you're you're a trained teacher. That's what you do. You. Right. It's another tool in your toolbox. Exactly. It, it's not the end all be all, but it's certainly a vehicle that helps you drive instruction. And for certain students, it's the best way. And for other students, it is a way. So. Right. I didn't ask you about this when we set up the show, but uh, uh, did, have you experimented with bringing your own device? You know, a lot of the kids, you know, now I've heard, you know, a lot of schools will take away the iPhones and things from kids, but actually other schools are experimenting with, well, look, if you got them, yep. you know, we can use them. So actually it actually extends some of the resources. I mean, our classrooms are kind of strapped anyway. Yep. Uh, we will be going through our district offers uh, training to schools that wish to become BYOD schools. Pine Hollow will be going through that this spring. We've kind of been what I refer to as BYOD light recently because our primary feeder elementary schools are all BYOD. And so um, it, it's just the world we live in nowadays. It's kind of a shame, I think, when kids walk around with this mini computer in their pocket and that's the world they live in, it's a shame to expect them to turn that off when they walk through the doors of the schoolhouse. So our challenge is to try to make sure we educate kids on how to use the devices appropriately yeah. um, when they're at school. And, and that's probably another one of those things, again, trying to get parents uh, comfortable. The, the classroom doesn't look anything like it did uh, when, uh, when they were in school or their parents were in school. I mean, there's, it, there may be desks and it's inside of a building, but beyond that, there's a lot of different things happening. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, well, I, I, the, I love the whole concept of the bring your own device. Again, it's something that, um, um, getting parents comfortable saying they're not actually playing, they're not Snapchatting, uh, they're right. actually learning. And um, uh, we appreciate what you are doing, um, you know, uh, leading a school uh, through this. And again, as a teacher, thank you always. We appreciate all our teachers. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank Thanks you. for having us. All right, after the break, this week's Leadership Spotlight.
Each week, Education Matters spotlights individuals demonstrating exceptional leadership in education in North Carolina based on nominations from you, our viewers. This week, we spotlight Liani Yurka and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences for a terrific initiative that aims to make informal science learning more accessible to all students. Take a look. When visiting any museum, generally the experience is really visual. You want to come and look at our dioramas and explore what is here. And if you don't have sight or you have limited sight or you've lost your vision, then how do you really fully engage in, in a museum experience? Uh, so we try to remove those barriers by um, describing what we have on display. Uh, we've created an app that's fully accessible for people who are visually impaired. If students are coming with their teacher or their chaperone and they know they could benefit from an accommodation, we will certainly provide that. We try to uh, talk to our educators and the staff we have here are trained so that they can provide the best experience and the best programming for students with disabilities across the board. Every fall we host the STEM Career Showcase for Students with Disabilities. It's dedicated entirely to students in grades 6 through 12 with disabilities who might be interested in pursuing careers in science, technology, engineering, or math, but might think that their disability or their unique situation in life might prohibit them from doing that. So what we do is bring professionals who are in these careers, they're doing cool stuff and they're breaking barriers just by being themselves. So we want them to come and talk to the students about the challenges but also the like really cool triumphs and the ways that they've learned to overcome or work around their disabilities in order to be really great in their fields. It's a, a day where they see that somebody else did it so they can do it too. The best situation is when we know that they have been struggling and they see somebody else who's been struggling but who's overcome it and they feel kind of motivated and empowered to do that. That's exactly what we need. If you know someone who deserves to be recognized, please visit our website, ncforum.org, and click on Education Matters, and you'll find a link to nominate someone in your community. After the break, this week's final word. Talking about technology and the promise to transform education is certainly not new. Uh, in years past, the excitement and allure of new technology often drove schools and school systems across the country to purchase lots of new software and hardware without a full understanding of the connectivity issues that existed in their school buildings or really having the capability to manage and effectively train instructional staff how to use that technology. So what happened is unfortunately many pricey smart boards became little more than pricey whiteboards and thousands of new tablets and notebooks were outdated even before they were fully deployed or they were purchased for schools that really lacked the internal Wi-Fi to really utilize the devices as intended. What our state embarked on in 2000 and 2006 with the School Connectivity Initiative and then later now with the North Carolina Digital Learning Plan in 2015 shows that our students are not the only ones learning. As a state, we learned a lot from the early exuberance. Thanks to investments from the state and from the federal government, we now moved to a place where almost every school in North Carolina not only has high-speed internet, but also has an internal network to allow teachers and students to actually take advantage of all the internet has to offer inside their classrooms. Beyond connectivity, we're also now investing in training school staff who administer the networks and teachers who are the ones using the technology to boost learning. Better uses of technology in our schools will not suddenly make everything better, Digital textbooks won't automatically allow the General Assembly to stop funding textbook budgets. Anyone who reads books on an iPad will tell you that Amazon doesn't give those away for free. And textbook publishers certainly aren't going to suddenly slash their profits either. Teachers are still going to be the single most important factor in our child's academic success and should always be our primary focus. Heck, a good teacher can even uh, teach sitting on a tree stump drawing in the dirt. But we should be proud of how our state is going after the digital transformation in education. That's it for this week's Education Matters. Next week, definitely tune in. We have a very special episode recorded live at the Public School Forum's Eggs and Issues Breakfast featuring Governor Roy Cooper. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.